from the heart space to the head space. Even though I, I hope you're seeing as I go on, I hope we have time to go into it, these are melding into one another. There is an overlapping. And in fact, if you look at the classic diagram of the anagram, the biggest space in the diagram is right now, between the four and the five, if you have one in front of you. There you see it right there, it's the biggest space. Now that was intentional in the, in the geometric diagram. The reason being, if you can bridge that gap between head and heart, that person is especially creative, holistic. And again, I'd speak to Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton's books will speak to your heart and your head simultaneously. But it's one of the hardest bridges to gap, to be fully in your heart and fully in your head and have them not cancel one another out. Good intellectual work and good emotional work and have the, the, the emotions feed the head and the head feed the emotions. But let's pretend we've jumped over that gap. We're now into the five space. The five is the pure, obvious compulsion. Remember that? The preceding number to the, the stress point. So in a certain sense, the five looks the most heady of all of the three head types. Externally, they tend to be absent-minded professors, right? They live their whole life uh, behind poker eyes with compulsive observation of the data. They're always taking in the data. They can't get enough data, and the data is never all in, right? <laughs> There's always more that can be known, another book that can be read. Even in terms of uh, our psychosomatic unity, I don't know hardly any fives beyond the age of 20 who don't have glasses. Because their energy is all in the eyes. They're watchers by definition. They watch, watch, watch. And their eyes are like vacuum cleaners, all right? They just take in, suck it in. Any kind of ideology, explanation, theory, description, they love the encyclopedia, you know. Now, I don't mean that they're all intellectuals. Some will just do it on a lifestyle level. They tend to love to sit in the back of the room. You fives are all back there, probably you're in the corners. You know? They never want to sit in the front. There's too much energy up here. They're always trying to control the energy and control themselves. They're very controlled people. And the, where, where there's the least energy is in the corner or the back of the room where they won't likely to be called upon. They won't be observed, but they can observe. That's what they like. They don't want you to know anything about their private life. They're very stingy. The Sufis called them the stingy ones. They're emotionally stingy. They're stingy with any stories about themselves. Even though they always want to find out everything about you. They just, they, they just want to gather information. They want to know. It's the compulsion to know. Uh, on the level of soul, it's as if there's too much heat in the kitchen. I'm leaving. And the way I'm leaving, I'm going into my head. And that's where they live from. In religious life, I remember uh, where we live in big communities. I did my first 15, 16 years. And the fives would always try to get the room on the third floor in the corner. You know, farthest away from anybody else. Huh? They like to live alone. They're natural hermits. Uh, they're natural celibates, probably for the wrong reason. Because, uh, frankly, sexual encounter is too emotional. Sexual engagement is too engaging. Huh? Uh, they, they don't have a strong need, compared to the rest of us, for sexual encounter. It's, I'd rather maintain myself and maintain my boundaries. They're always maintaining their boundaries and they overdo it. Uh, they, um, the animal is the owl, therefore. The barn owl at that. Picture an owl. You've been in the barn already for an hour. Then you hear a little tiny sound and you look up and there he is with those great big eyes just watching you. They love to watch. And from that then, they love to come up with universal theories. 
their, their philosophers, Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventure, Hegel, Heidegger, all of them. How else would you come up with a great big universal explanation, Aristotle, unless you were a five? You sit back and you observe for 20 years and then you come up with your theory, you see? And this settles all the dust. So now I don't have to emotionally engage with people. I don't have to emotionally engage with life or with naked bodies or anything like that. I'll just think my way through life. I'll just plan my way through life. I'll just organize my way in a mental sense uh, through life. They sever the connections as much as they can with everything and everybody. And that's why they can become real loners and even dangerous people if they don't have some healthy community and some healthy relationship in their life because there's no, there's no reference point for them. There's no outer criteria that can critique them. Um, they, uh, they can be quiet, but here's the, the flip side of them. Sometimes when they start telling you their theories, you can't shut them up. So they flip from total silence to, okay, we got it. You can be quiet now, you know? <laughs> and they go on and on and on and on and on because they've been living inside of this head They've constructed this huge universal field theory, you know, and now you've got to be subjected to the whole thing. And because they have cut themselves off from human relationship, most of you, especially you twos, threes, and fours, you know how to read people's eyes when they're bored with you. And they're saying, okay, we got it, stop. The five doesn't read your eyes. They just keep talking. <laughs> no, we got it. We've heard it. We don't need to hear anymore. You finally got to get the hook and pull them off the stage. This, these are classic college professors, of course, who are given this permission to stand in, behind a pulpit like I'm doing and just talk to you ad nauseum, you know. And then our professors, they'd go back to their cloister. We wouldn't see them till the next Latin class. And they'd stand there and bore us for an hour and a half. Fives, forgive me, can be very boring you know? because they're, they've had no reality check for the meaningfulness of their ideas or, or the helpfulness of their ideas, right? It's all inside of their own little control tower bouncing back and forth. And that's why we call them the absent-minded professor or the old curmudgeon who's cut off. He, he doesn't know he's right, he's brilliant in some ways, but he's stupid in other ways unless he connects with this four wing and gets his heart and his sensitivity in shape, then you can have the brilliant professor who doesn't just have the information, but I can tell when it's getting through to you. I can tell when it's meaningful. I can tell if it's making connections for your life and, and so forth. But I would say the five is the typical boring professor, right? Who has nothing to say, uh, but sometimes does have something to say. <laughs> and you, you, but you have to wait around for the second semester before you'll hear it, you know? Because the whole first semester is just building up to the second semester, right? And he keeps talking around it and around it with theory and theology. And finally, he himself understands his own point. Uh, but that takes him a while. Yes? Well, I'm just going to say, he's not talking for the audience, but he's just talking like he's having a conversation. Yeah, himself. I'm afraid you're right. Yes. It's an internal monologue, and you're subjected to it. <laughs> yeah? That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now, he does find great energy in his inner ideas, do you understand, or she. And um, so he, he, I don't want to say the person is narcissistic or selfish, but they just haven't learned this world of vis-a-vis. -vis. They don't know how to act back and forth and to, to throw the ball back and forth. So it often feels like a monologue and not a, a dialogue. That's right. So they're stingy not for money as such. They're stingy for information. They keep it. They love books. I had a woman who was a five tell me that to be in a library was like a, a sexual orgasm. <laughs> Sounds disappointing to most of us. but so, <laughs> She said to have books all around me is just a rush, just a rush of excitement, you know. <laughs> and you've got to know that's partially true for a five. They love their books. They love their ideas. <laughs> uh, 
they don't uh, tend to spend a lot of money on themselves. They, uh, they really don't, except on books, but no, nothing else. Uh, they can live very simply. Their most common phrase back to you after you've talked, if you were able to get a word in, is interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Now, you know, <laughs> interesting is a non-committal statement. Right? You know, it doesn't help you in the least. Right? You, well, and I'll say, what well, was it? Good interesting or bad interesting? <laughs> well, I, I'll have to think about it a little more, he'll say, you know. Uh, and this is one of the great difficulties of the five is making commitments. They're so withheld that uh, commitment is a certain degree of emotional engagement with the other. But they don't often even want to emotionally engage with your ideas or with your relationship. Uh, but on the positive side, if you want a good, objective counselor, get a five. If you want power behind the throne, who, it's a volatile, emotional mix inside the job right now. You want someone who can calmly say, well, there's this way of looking at it, there's that way of looking at it, and I wouldn't take that too seriously, and don't worry about that too much. Dang it, they're usually right. Hmm? See, so some have said detachment is their sin and detachment is their gift. You can, it's the only number you can use the same word for both their sin and their gift. Detachment, detachment. And detachment is a virtue. When you need objectivity, when you need calm evaluation, so that's probably why they make more objective philosophers or accountants or engineers Thank God, or librarians. Thank God for fives who will be comfortable sitting in the back office. They love computers, of course. They're just addicted to computers now. They can live their whole life. Instead of a wife, I have a computer. You know? so, instead of a husband, I have a computer. And I can just relate to this nonstop. But... Um, I have to say, over the years, many of my, my best advisors have been fives. And especially in difficult, demanding situations when everybody is taking sides and everybody is throwing around blame and, and making it totally good or totally bad, the five can very often see it objectively. Precisely, I think, because of their withheldness. The five, I'm told, feels empty. And the, the information is, is an endless attempt to fill up that inner emptiness. They, they feel like there's a great big hole. I've had them even describe it for me. And it'll never be filled. That's their primordial soul experience is I'm empty. I'm empty. There's nothing there. Now, they don't have a lot of need for personal feedback, although they do. We all need other people to love us and to like us, but, but they are the quintessential headspace. And so they've whittled that down to the minimum. They can do without people the most. You know, speaking of marriages, I've probably met uh, more two, five marriages than I would have ever expected. And it's a classic example of marrying your exact opposite. Because the two is the compulsive giver, giving for the wrong reasons, but still giving. And the five is the compulsive taker. Who's always, and, and so you can see when they're both 19, they don't have much self-knowledge yet. There's a natural attraction. Uh, let's make him the five. He appears so masculine and grounded and calm and collected. And she's so bubbly and emotional and lovey-dovey and, and kissy-feely. You know, well, she's just totally attracted to this male opposite huh? that she is not. Huh? And that's the usual pattern I find, the woman being the two and the man being a five. And it works for about three years. Mm -hmm. And, of course, all marriages then face the shadow at a certain point. And the five starts wondering, when are you, you know, uh, going to let me just stay at home? I don't want to go to all these parties, you know. Or I don't want to be a volunteer at the church. I just want to watch television. <laughs> And, of course, she starts resenting him because uh, he is staying home all the time. And she wants a lot of social relationships. I don't know why God let us make these kind of mistakes. But we, we are attracted to our opposite. And we'll see that 
in other cases too. Now the country I gave, I don't know that it's the best, but I, I use Scotland, maybe, maybe it's stereotypical, but our image of the stingy, stingy Scotsman and the uh, aloof, really Anglo-Saxon gentleman, it's, it's really uh, probably a bit of both of those. Uh, maybe I, I would just say, uh, you know, the UK, the English and the, and the Scots. Uh, that stiff upper lip stuff that we make fun of in the English, uh, this withheldness, this intellectual snobbery, this superiority complex, that's all five stuff. And it pretty much is our stereotype of the English. Right? It isn't always true, as we well found out last year, but it, but it is the public image of reserve, you know, always staying back from. Uh, there's not the moving toward. And we're going to see that in all three of these types. And I should have made that point earlier. The five, six, and seven, their first response to reality is back away from it. It's not to engage with it. It's not to hug it. It's not to embrace it. It's to pull back, find my own ground, find my own understanding, and perhaps re-enter. <laughs> but far too often, I'm afraid, they stay in the withdrawn position. That's particularly true of the five. They're classic avoiders. Uh, Buddhism would very much come out of the five space. It makes an art form out of detachment. It makes an art form out of observation, you see? And beautiful, it's right on. Uh, whereas Christian religion, you, you take the image of the crucified Jesus, it comes much more out of two space. A naked, bleeding man on a cross, that's the compassionate lover, do you see? And the Sufis did call Jesus a two. We, of course, as Christians would say, well, he's all numbers. But they, the, what they saw was the great perfect lover who loved sacrificially for the right reasons. So take some consolation if you're twos. Maybe Jesus was a two. Um, when they find the freedom to give it out before they've taken it in, uh, instead of collecting energy to once in a while take a risk and give energy before I take it from you, right? then you know they're growing up. When they can get involved in various forms of volunteerism. I knew a wonderful woman in, in Cincinnati who was a five. And wouldn't you know, she became a massage therapist. Now, that you want to talk about acting against you. You know, to touch other bodies and to serve other bodies for an hour and a half, you know. She totally moved against her compulsion and is a very healthy spiritual director today uh, because she learned how to balance herself out. But that was a heavy price for her to pay. That would not be her natural mode to be massaging other people's bodies. Huh? It, it, it took a major giving, a major risk-taking, a major moving against the, uh, the withholding and the collecting instinct. There are unhealthy fives that you're around and you actually feel like you're being sucked on. I don't mean sexually, I mean, uh, I mean like they're taking your energy, you know? Like they're, they're I'm worn out. I just been in the room for 15 minutes with this person. Because they're, they're, they're always wanting whatever, I, maybe I feel it because I'm supposed to be a knowledgeable person supposed to be, and so they'll always want more of my knowledge or more of my facts, and they'll just come with one question, two questions, three questions, four questions. <laughs> Both the five and the six are questioners. Huh? They've always got to get you by their questions. Um, that's just one shape. But I think uh, if, you, if you try the, uh, the English and the Scots, you've got a, a partial feel for it. The, um, the burrowing fox is another animal that spends much, if not most, of his day inside of the burrow and just comes and looks out and sees if there's any risk demanded or any threat. If there's no emotional risk, no emotional threat, maybe I'll come out. Some say that the five lives their entire life behind a one-way mirror in which they can look out, but they won't let you look back at them. They, they, if you say the word share, 
they'll, they'll try to head for the quickest door. You know? <laughs> they hate to share, especially if it has to do with feelings. When we started the Kiss of Peace in the Catholic Church, they say all the fives left. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean I really got to touch somebody else, you know? Touching is not their thing. They're not real tactile people. But again, they're, uh, they're the objective people that somehow ground the flights of fancy and the flights of emotion that a lot of the rest of us get lost in. And with that, the six. <laughs> <laughs>